presentation comes up. Well, anyway, you've probably heard a lot of talks about Bose-Einstein condensation, and uh, that's going to be the focus of this one. That's, at some point, my own hearing of talks on BEC, I made a transition between a feeling of shut up and tell me more. So I don't know which type of talk this will be, but it's my view that, that BEC really is an amazing phenomenon. And uh, it's, it's had a transformative effect on atomic physics, in my view. And it's one that I think Fauna would have liked because it's emphasized the real importance of quantum mechanics and many particle systems in a way that has a lot of applications and also a lot of fundamental meaning and is attracting a lot of interest. Now, there's a whole bunch of ways of, of, of describing how amazing Bose-Einstein condensation is. This, is. this is an example which I saw just a few weeks ago, which I found touching in its simplicity and, and strangeness. Uh, it's a gas produced by, in the lab of Ted Hedge in Munich. Uh, it's a gas rubidium atoms. They've been confined originally in an optical lattice, much like what Carl Williams was talking about uh, before. The density of, there's about a million atoms in here. Their density is, is 100,000 times less than that of air. That's a, that's a very tenuous system. And if you work out the pressure, it's something like 10 to the minus 10 Pascal, which I've used in more convenient units here. I think, is there a token experimentalist here? Ah, Dr. DeMauro. It, would this be a good vacuum in your lab, 10 to the minus 12 door? Not good enough? That'd be an ultra-high vacuum, wouldn't it? <laughs> so you wouldn't call this a, a system, we wouldn't think of this as a system uh, dominated by amazing collective phenomena. But when this a gas is allowed to expand, you're seeing a photograph here of the density, it expands like a cube, like a, like a, like a cube. And I don't mean it just looks like a cube for a while. It keeps going like a cube. The word gas was, was dreamed up by a, a Flemish chemist named, well, that guy. Carl? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a neologism. It's a word that was made up to describe gas. It, it's coined from the Greek chaos. It comes from the 17th century. Von Helmont was the guy's name. And uh, he obviously had an anticipation that a gas was something without form, just consisting of chaotic motions. So it's surprising you get this sort of order, e orderly evolution of, uh, of, a, of a completely, what you would think would be the simplest, uh, most disordered physical system. Now, why is that? Well, before replying, I'd like to uh, give a word from one of our sponsors, the National Science Foundation. National Science Foundation is very uh, keenly interested in efforts at public outreach to explain science. So I'm happy to announce that I've, been, I've signed a contract with 20th Century Fox to produce the sequel of their classic film drama, Dude, Where's My Car? I'm now just waiting for Fox to sign their part of the contract. The title of the sequel is Dude, That's Quantum Mechanics. This is an effect of quantum mechanics. Now, at times like this, I wish Steve Harris were still with us. He's up there now. Oh, I'll, up there in the balcony. Uh, because there's nothing in the double E department at Stanford, they teach in the country, I suppose. And if you have a phased array of antennas, you can make a, direct, a highly directional output, which, uh, which, is, which is what this is. And it depends only upon their existing. Sorry. There existing a coherent phase relationship among the various antennas. So somehow, it's been possible to make a system of phased atoms in this array where there's a completely, well, a sensibly constant phase of the many particle wave function across the array in the initial state. And that's what enables it to propagate outwards a highly directional, uh, highly directional uh, matter wave. Let's see, why is this po why, why this is why this is so important? I mean, just stating it as a phase matter wave, it, it 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 makes it seem quite simple to understand, which it is. But how do you actually arrange to create matter in such conditions? That's the thing that's truly amazing. It's a revolutionary aspect of the experiments that were first successful in Jilla back in uh, 1996, I guess it was. Though, of course, they, they, they were demonstrating something that, that Einstein thought up, which, when you read Einstein's own words about it, it makes it seem quite remarkable. Uh, he doesn't really focus on the issue of BEC being a very low temperature phenomenon. In fact, uh, quite the opposite. 
the way he portrays it in his original, in the abstract of his original paper, is that it's a high temperature phenomenon. That is, I mean, it'd be no big mistake. You cool things down, everything, no, no big surprise. You cool things down, everything goes into the ground state. That's not what happens in Bose condensation. Einstein pointed out that even a very high temperature, there'd be a critical density in the ideal gas so that if you increase that density, say by pressure pushing in piston walls, you get a macroscopic population of um, atoms in the ground quantum state of the system. So that means that the preparation of highly coherent states of matter is actually aided by thermodynamics. It's aided by statistical mechanics. It's quite the contrary to what has been the case in atomic physics with its focus on careful state preparation and analysis. And so that this gives us the ability for looking at a lot of, a lot of new effects. And this field is, as you know, attracting uh, quite a bit of attention from other areas of science. So what I'm going to focus on today is the role of the quantum mechanical phase of what, oh, I've erased the thing that was an asterisk here. Maybe not. Ah, the phase of, of what they call condensed matter, the order parameter, which to us, if I can say that in this room, is, is the condensate wave function. The wave function, as, you know, as represented in the Hartree approximation of many particle system that describes each particle in the system. And so uh, I'm going to tell you uh, two simple and related stories about the occurrence of, of some forms of um, topological excitations in these condensed systems, the production of soliton, solitary waves, solitary matter waves, and various forms of uh, vortices with a focus on the existence of ring structures. And I guess for the, the purpose of, um, of this Fano symposium, well, you know, would this be of interest to Ugo Fano? Well, who knows? Uh, <laughs> but they, um, these phenomena are, you know, they're pure quantum mechanical aspects of many body physics. In other words, without many particle interactions, you do not see these types of phenomena in quantum mechanics, or certainly, at least, certainly not solitons. And as concerns vortex structures, they're just a, a completely different type of thing. And yes, they do have classical analogs, but um, that, that is the, the name soliton and vortex already existed for us to use. We didn't have to invent a new one like gas. But still, the, the actual uh, superfluid aspects of these systems are, um, uh, again, due to totally to quantum mechanics. Oh, so I've, I guess I've made this point. The, the existence and this rigidity of the phase, which is a concept I think first sort of emphasized by P.W. Anderson in reference to the Josephson effect and superconductivity, means that you can get this amazing sort of collective phenomenon, even under circumstances where you'd like to think things were, uh, were more or less independent particles. So I worked it out that the superfluidity, I, I coined this phrase here, the nano superfluid, you get superfluidity in atomic gas systems that have densities of nanograms per cubic centimeter. And the, 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 these sorts of topological structures have been seen in those things. I, uh, the original work I'll tell you about today, at least the done, that done in my group, is due to a number of people, a very good crew of students and postdocs. In particular, uh, most of what I show you today is due to David Fader, who has just joined the faculty at the University of Calgary, and to Bill Reinhardt, senior collaborator from the University of Washington, and a man always admired by Ugo Fano, loved and respected. Um, as I do. So, um, right, I will, I'll, I'm going to just do some cartoon descriptions that show how some of these phenomena emerge from the simplest quantitative uh, picture we have for, for Bose-Einstein condensates, one which, which works remarkably well, perhaps too well, perhaps unfortunately well in practice, and then show, uh, and then, and then show some examples. So the, um, the standard framework used by people to describe the basic structure and dynamics of condensates is the time-dependent uh, so-called Gross-Pitievsky or nonlinear Schrodinger equation for the condensate wave function. This size, the wave function of the condensate, meaning the wave function that describes a probability amplitude of finding an atom in a certain position. All the internal degrees of freedom of the atomic structure are traced out in the work that I'm going to show you here. And I'm going to uh, start by focusing on some aspects of the stationary form of this, just to sort of 
get some understanding of how these soliton structures emerge from, from, from something that is, you know, relatively understandable, just has spatial coordinates in no time. I should mention another nice thing about working in this field is there still are some of these legendary characters around. This is Lev Pityevsky. He is the author of, well, he's the, he's the current owner of the Landau and Lifshitz books because, you know, Landau passed from the scene and Lifshitz was hanging around. Well, there's a couple by Lifshitz and Pityevsky. And he invented this equation 35 years ago. It went into disuse pretty quickly, but now it's emerged as something very important, and he's still very active. This is a photograph taken uh, last week in Trento, Italy. Actually, I was having an argument with him about something, and I've learned, learned how to deal with these Russians. You say, huh, that's in Landau and Lifshitz. Just go look it up. So I said, that's in Landau and Lifshitz. Just go look it up. Then he says, it's not there, but I'll be putting it in the next edition. <laughs> Okay, so I thought I'd start by talking about, instead of the full gross Pityevsky equation, I thought I'd start by talking about a particle in a box, but I figure a box is too hard. Oh, thank you. I planted a stooge to laugh at that. A box is too hard. So we'll start, let's look at a, a particle in no box, and then we'll apply the eigenchannel R matrix method of John Ming Lee to compute the spectrum after we do a fully general solution. So this is a wave equation. This is leading to something. This is a wave equation for a free particle, the time-dependent wave equation for the free particle. It can be solved by use of the transcendental, one of the transcendental functions of mathematical physics. Or, if you'd forgotten what the solution of this equation is, as some students do, you can, you can plot the solution. So here's a simplified version of this, right? I'm just eliminating some symbols. And then you can recognize this as as you know, being related to a perfect, a perfect differential. You just multiply by psi prime on both sides. You can integrate the equation directly. So you get, you get the conservation of energy, right? This equation. Actually, maybe this is the fundamental equation. I don't know. But back in the Fano group, we all started with you know, the differential form. So basically, the, this equation here is equivalent to the most motion of a classical particle in a potential that's quadratic in the wave function. You, know, you have this, this constant of the motion which is like the kinetic energy, the derivative of the wave function squared, and the amplitude squared. And so if you've forgotten what the solution of this is, you can, you can get a graphical description of the answer. Here's, you know, here's the potential, here's the coordinate, and for the given value of the constant, you have this bounding surface, and so you can see that the wave function just undergoes uh, periodic motion, you know, as it says in all the textbooks. Okay, so let's, let's look at the same, the same deal with the gross pityevsky equation. And so now, uh, okay, simplified notation, we have a nonlinear equation. Someone might know the name for the solutions, uh, but again, if you, they're, they're, th these are known functions of mathematical physics, by the way. Uh, but if you didn't, once again, because the wave function is homogeneous in the, uh, sorry, the equation of motion is homogeneous in the wave function, you could just... Uh, integrate it directly, and so you get another equivalent uh, classical motion. This is, this, is, this is an equation for positive scattering length repulsive potential. And so that, that binding surface looks, that, that potential surface looks like this. A little bit strange. So here's, here's the, one of the most important solutions to that equation. It's psi is equal to a constant. That means that the, the wave function is perched precariously, you might say, on this point of apparent instability and it just stays there forever and that that describes a condensate that's constant everywhere something that's maybe confined by a very large box oh what about that box so another important solution is when you you have a box you put a hard wall down so the condensate wave function has to vanish but then let's say you did that to the homogeneous condensate so you say well it's going to rise to some constant value and stay that way well here's how that solution works uh, you start with a wave function at zero at the origin, and then you launch it to rise up to this, on this surface to coast in, take an infinitely long time to come to rest at the uh, turning point. This is one of these things in which experiment will, uh, a theory will always be an experiment. I mean, it's just not very practical to do this in the lab, um, though nature, as uh, John Bone said, always finds a way. Uh, that, that's, an, that, that's an equation to be uh, integrated directly. It gives you this characteristic length of a condensate 
condensate solutions in arc tangent near the origin. So it's a very sharp rise and the sort of a constancy uh, that goes on. And the characteristic sizes of these, the characteristic size of this notch here, this so-called healing length, the distance over which in response to a disturbance, the condensate wave function rises back to a steady value is of the order of a micron for the systems of practical interest in the lab. Okay, the last such solution. I should say, you know, you might think, what about these things that are like, like they're falling downhill? In fact, these do, well, as anyone who solved these sorts of equations numerically knows, you, you get a lot of these solutions uh, in practice, but some of them actually have uh, important implications for evanescent waves, which I won't discuss further. But basically, this is sort of the generic solution where for this nonlinear equation now, you can see the wave function just oscillates back and forth indirectly. This sort of underlies some of the basic ideas of how to generate solitons and condensates that have been, been cooked up over the past few years. This just shows, so these are, by the way, these are Jacobian elliptic functions that I'm plotting. They're the SN of the argument. This is the spatial coordinate here. Here's the, the wave function. This is the lowest, the ground state of a condensate in a one-dimensional box. You see it vanishes at the wall, so it has that characteristic healing length -like structure. Then there are other, then there are higher excited states of this equation, which are enormously excited states of the many particle system. Th this, this corresponds to a wave function in which all particles have one node, which is very, very energetic. It's not, it's not a low-lying excitation built on top of this state, but it's an excitation that's possible to realize in the lab. Um, basically, let me just say it briefly, by taking something like this, pinching it tight by use of a, what he called a septum, a very thin barrier, and then inducing a phase difference of, of 180 degrees or pi radians between the two halves. Then you, then you have a system which, when you remove, if you remove the wall very carefully and don't cause excitations, you ought to have something that retains its form at least for a while. Uh, so I'm going to show you some examples of that. Let's see. Now this is this is just a repeat of what I said before. How do you how do you get to, how do you get to this sort of pre-solitonic state? Well, it's a dark soliton, a stationary soliton. Uh, separate the condensate with a septum, introduce a phase shift with a phase shifting device, and then uh, remove the septum and let it go. I'll show you how that's done in a minute in the lab. Uh, but here's here's a here's a somewhat more here's a here's a, here's a numerical simulation performed by. Bill Reinhardt, uh, that shows that shows what happens. This so these are this is position. This is a this is a this is a condensate, a one-dimensional condensate in the harmonic trap, not in the box. And this is the initial density, the density as a function of position. These frames are time. This is several. Uh, now, Bo, wh what are we doing today for lunch? And then any discussion? Six plus five. Okay, so I will stop at at five minutes past twelve, according to that clock up there. Very good. So anyway, um, this shows a series of initial value problems in which a notch was a, a density notch was put in the condensate, and then there was a phase jump ac induced across the notch. Here's the value of the phase jump. Well, phase jump with respect to pi. So for uh, a zero phase jump, you just see that the, the, the density of the constant evolves in a very stationary way. It just, it's, it's constant in time. For slight offset, you can see this notch starts to propagate. For larger phase offsets, you can see the continuing uh, increase of the slope of this notch. It's increasing velocity of the soliton propagation. And then the appearance of these uh, other peaks that have a slope that doesn't depend upon the phase offset. So these, this, is, this turns out to be a soliton motion, very much like the, uh, with the speed that's predicted by the Josephson effect. The velocity of this soliton is um, proportional to the sine of the phase offset. And then these other features are sound waves. They always have the same speed, the so-called Bogoyubov speed of sound. So you get a combination of the topological type of excitation along with disturb, you know, foam uh, emerging on the condensate. So, in the lab, of course, they deal with three-dimensional systems, and here's an implementation which was invented at uh, NIST and Gaithersburg and the group of Bill Phillips. Uh, I think Steve Rolston was the original 
well, I don't know who, you know, they're all great. Uh, and the, the idea is very simple. You have a condensate and a razor blade. We call the mask due to the new sensitivity of the nation after September 11th, the mask. Um, and you, blot, you, blot, you just expose the condensate to some light. The part that's illuminated undergoes an AC Stark effect and gets an accompanying phase shift. And the part that's dark just you know, does its condensate thing there. This, and it, this is the way in which you can cause a sharp jump in phase across a condensate. And this shows the uh, experimental traces of the um, expanding density of the cloud um, accompanied by some calculations, which are first principle solutions of the uh, time-dependent gross pitievsky equation carried out by David Fader. And so this, you can see there's a notch that propagates. Looks sort of like a hamburger here. And the, the agreement with the experiment is, is quite satisfactory. Now, in the... Um, these solitons in a, th a three-dimensional structure turn out not to be stable. So here's a movie in which actually you've got you've to pay attention at the start right now to see the soliton. And then it breaks up, showing a lot of structure here. And when we, this, is a, this, is a, this is a simulated photograph. That is, we've done a calculation, and then we do a line of sight photograph of the density on the computer to simulate what is seen in the experiment, of course. And so in the photograph, you see these, these nodes showing up here. This, uh, we're going to call it a trilobite, but the name was already taken, bastards. Um, uh, it's not really a trilobite. We are well, first, thank you. Uh, first, um, well, so, oh, this is, a, this is a vortex core structure emerging. That's what the residents of Flatland said one night when I blew a smoke ring into their world. They saw these vortex cores show up and spin off, not really appreciating that what they were seeing was just the structure of a, of a three-dimensional ring penetrating into a two-dimensional world. So the understanding of these vortex motions, uh-oh, in um, this is the same data, color differently seen from a different angle, which the color represents the phase of the quantum mechanical wave function. And the luminosity, the apparent luminosity of the points is, is I think I have two minutes left before question time goes. Thank you. Uh, is, is, is the, the low density regions are the most luminous just in order to display the region's low density. And so you can see that this, this wave function evolves into a system which spins off these, these vortex ring structures, at least as seen on the computer. And a subsequent experiment by Jill, a completely different experiment, but again, producing what we call a dark soliton, um, saw something similar. It was possible to, to visualize it in a... Uh, in a clever way. And so these are images of, of, a, of what, they, they produce a, a two species condensate with one species separating the other two to produce a density notch and then watch its evolution. And then by uh, a, clever, a clever trick which involves subtracting out the um, a Thomas Fermi representation of the overall density structure and looking at the expanded condensate from various angles, they th see these very suggestive structures, which are those of vortex rings. And again, um, that's, that's seen quite clearly in the, in the simulations done by the gross pitievsky equation. So in the one minute remaining, I guess I'll just, I'll just uh, here, here's, here's again a simulated photograph of the evolution of the density of the condensate of that dark soliton, you can see it breaks up and very, very, you know, very complex striated motions appear, at least as seen in a line of sight density photograph. And then this is the, um, this is the, the representation as I showed you before with the low density regions of the condensate being the brightest and the, um, and the, the color representing the phase. So a wrap around the spectrum corresponds to winding the phase by two pi. And so you can see quite clearly this, the predominant mode of decay of the soliton uh, is into ring structures that actually have a you know, good deal of uh, endurance. Right, well, I could go on and on and on, but this Beau Gao is a very hard and stern session chairman, so I'll skip to the third hour of my talk. And um, I'll just... Um, just comment on um, 
recent experiments, so starting about a year ago at MIT, and now they've been picked up by several groups, Oxford, ENS, uh, JILA, uh, have shown, this, shown the, uh, have demonstrated the existence of large vortex array structures, and we've managed to reproduce these things in three-dimensional GP calculations. So this is a simulation of a, an experiment at JILA, uh, which, in which a, the thermal cloud surrounding condensate is rotated, and that imparts a sense of rotation of the condensate as well. And as the rotation of the cloud increases towards the, the frequency that's the, the, the frequency of the confining radial trap, the, uh, the condensate flattens out due to the centrifugal force, and you see a, large, a larger and larger number of vortex, regularly, um, regularly structured vortex arrays coming in. And this, this represents something, again, unanticipated by us, I guess well known in classical superfluidity, the transition of this, this superfluid cons, cons, condensate in a rotating form into a rotating, uh, virtually rigid, a rotating rigid body. This is demonstrated by looking at the phase of the condensate wave function in the plane, symmetry plane of the condensate. Around each of these vortex lines, you see a phase wind of 2 pi. You see right through the rainbow there. But the, the way that the, that the contributions from the many vortices line up gives you basically sort of a bicycle spoke kind of deal here around the periphery of the condensate, which represents just a uniform velocity of rotation of the, uh, of the system in the way that we expected, uh, more or less expected if it were a rigid body. So to conclude, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's really a great time for this field, I think. Uh, these new phenomena have, have been made possible in the lab, and they're, they're demonstrating a, a whole range of things that, that are, I think, easy for atomic physicists to understand, but they're, they're very, very interesting to people in condensed matter and particle physics. And I, th I think this field is just starting. So thank you very much.